I want to share with you today um, experiences from Sweden in particular that speak far beyond Sweden, that can help raise over consciousness, over awareness of what it takes to live together today in a globalized world and understand each other, build bridges rather than uh, sit on each over riches and, uh, and uh, be skeptical. Um, the story I will tell deals with a girl named Fadima Shahindal who came to Sweden when she was seven years old from Turkey from Kurdistan in Turkey with her family. And when Fadima was 21, this takes us to 1998, February 1998, she goes to the police and she says to the police, please help me because my family is threatening to take my life because they have discovered that I have a boyfriend. She was 20 years old, 21 years old at the time, and the family had at the time lived in Sweden for about 16 years. They were not newcomers. Well, what did the police say when Padima told them this? They didn't believe her. They say there's no family that is going to take the life of the daughter because she has a boyfriend. And uh, Fadima said afterward that she felt humiliated because the, fam the police would not believe her. The family had threatened to kill her because they had discovered that she had a secret relationship with a Swedish-Iranian boy called Patrick. So when the police is not believing, Fadima thinks, what can I do to protect my life? And she thinks, well, if I go to the Swedish media, maybe if I become publicly known, my family will not dare to move. So what does she do? She goes to the Swedish media and tells her story. And she says, my family threatens to kill me in an honor killing, and in a moment I will describe what that is. Well, that created an uproar in Sweden. Um, I mean, people... Uh, everyone was then writing about Fadima, but by her going out with her story, her family felt utterly humiliated. They felt that she is bringing over secrets out in the public place, and she's throwing shame and disgrace. So, that, so they were infuriated, and they increased their threats against her. I will have to make this story short. What next happens is that she goes back to the police. She is believed. She takes her father and brother to court. They are sentenced for threatening her. And um, in May 1998, and then on the day in June 1998, when Fadima and her friend Patrick are planning to move together in an apartment. On that very day, Patrick dies in a car crash. So the police investigate, but the police don't find evidence of Fadima's family being involved. So she has lost Patrick. By this time, she's totally ostracized by her family, who have said to her that, OK, we are, not, we are going to let you live but only if you go into exile in Sweden. They say, you must never come to Uppsala where we live because that's our home territory. If you stay in exile in another place in Sweden, you know, we, you have a chance. So what Fadima does then in the fall of 1998, after Patrick dies, she decides to stay away from the media. She decides to devote herself to study social work so she can help other immigrant, you know, children and 
and uh, parents, and she studies in a place called Östersund in Sweden, and, uh, and, and does very well. But she misses her family tremendously, because she loves her family. And the thing is, she understands her family. She doesn't condemn her parents. She understands that her parents come from a culture in Kurdistan, in Turkey, where the interests of the group are more important than the welfare of the individual. So she, she tries even to make the Swedes understand that her parents are not monsters. They are, from their own point of view, responsible when they want to prevent their daughter from engaging in relationship with this Swedish Iranian. I'm making a very long story short. In November 2001, not long after 9-11, well, she um, is asked to give a talk in the old parliament building in Sweden on a conference on integration, how we people can live together. She's afraid to do it because she knows that if the family comes to know, they will not like it. But she also wants to create an understanding among Swedes about the kind of predicament she and many others are in. The family comes to know, and they say amongst themselves, wow, she's even going out in parliament and telling of a story. It wasn't in parliament, but it was in the old parliament building. And her parents didn't know the difference. Well, this is in November 2001. In January 2002, Fadima meets secretly with her mother and two younger sisters in Uppsala. She has been able to re-establish relationship with her mother. The women have been forbidden to see each other, and they meet in secret, and they are found out. And then the tragedy happens, and the father kills Fadima in front of her mother and two younger sisters. The mother was, oh, she was so distraught, and she said, I did it, it was my fault, because, but for her, Fadima wouldn't have come to Uppsala, but it was a mother's love and a daughter's love, and uh, well, so it happened. When Fadima was buried on the 4th of February 2002, all of Sweden came to a standstill. The funeral took place in the ancient cathedral in Uppsala, and it was attended by, among others, the Swedish crown princess, the Swedish minister of integration and equality, the Swedish minister of justice, and other dignitaries. It is not common in Sweden or any country for a young deceased girl to be given what is, in effect, a state funeral. But that is what Fadima was given, and it was the nation's way of making apologies and showing their bereavement and that they had failed in time to protect someone like her and also others who have made similar, met similar fates. Um, oh, um, and at the funeral, I have to tell you, um, it, it was so done in such a wonderful way because Fadima's family was Muslim, and she was buried in this Christian cathedral. Um, but the bishop took care not to offend anyone, wanted to include people of all religions. So she spoke about compassion and tolerance, and all the music played was Fadima's favorite songs, like Bridge Over Troubled Water, 
and her all-time favorite, maybe some of you know it, U2's One. Um, I, uh, in 1974, the European Union, vis-a-vis -vis scholars in many countries to help them create awareness, consciousness about the kinds of dangers that young people like Fadima could be in because of what is called an honor code. I'm sure, you know, we all have concepts of honor. And to us all, honor is something that is something good, something positive. You know, you are honoring. I say it's an honor for me to be here today. That means I'm very, very happy. It's positive. And I also feel that, you know, I, I'm honored that you have invited me. I think well of myself. And uh, I feel I get social recognition. It makes me feel good. Well, in all societies in the, in the world, there are concepts of honor, but societies differ according to what you have to do to get honor. And it is a fact of life, unfortunately, that there are some communities across religions. There's not, it's not Muslims. It is among Muslims, among Hindus, among Christians, among secular people, among Sikhs, where honor is defined in such a way that the family honor depends upon the sexual purity of girls. So the way for the family to retain their honor is to co keep control of the girls. And if a girl like Fadima has a boyfriend, then it's not her family, her parents' honor that is destroyed, but it's, it is the honor of her whole clan, a thousand people, many of them living in Turkey, some of them living in Sweden, distribute, distributed among different nations. This honor code, unfortunately, is such that in many societies, if a girl then disgraces the family, then the family, the community will honor the family if they take the life of the girl, because then the family shows that they won't accept any offense to their honor, and also because the communities have a common interest in keeping control of the girls, so that the girls don't marry the wrong men. You know, girls, girls are the ones who have children, so it can be important. It's boys, or say Fadime's brother had a Swedish girlfriend, it didn't matter. But to keep control of her was very important because she was a girl and girls bear children and so girls should marry the right men. Now in Europe today, uh, such honor killings as we call them happen in all countries. There have been many in Sweden, in Norway, in Denmark, in Netherlands, in Britain. Uh, and there are of course in Pakistan, Turkey, Jordan, etc. They are called honor killings because they are killings done on behalf of a collective, and as I said, the community rewards the murder with honor. But there are many people working, like after Fadime's death, in the communities, in the Kurdish communities, in every country, to try to rethink this notion of honor and to make it reconceptualize it so that to gain honor, you do something that furthers the welfare of everyone. And there are young boys you will be interested to know in Sweden, boys of immigrant background, your age, who have, have, who are calling themselves Sharaf heroes. Sharaf is Arabic for honor. And what these boys are doing is they are going out to schools. They are going out to communities. They are saying, 
we want to make honor into a concept that furthers and protects life. And they say, these boys, we don't want to be the guardians of our sisters. We want our sisters to have liberty and freedom like the boys have. But the fact that these boys who are themselves immigrant are doing this means they are able to enter into contact with parents. They are able to speak to religious leader. They are able to recruit them to engage in the same kind of, you know, the same kind of, of task uh, to, 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 to rethink honor, to make it into a concept of well-being uh, and not uh, something that justifies taking a life. Um, the, I would also like to say a um, few words about Fadime's mother. Fadime's mother had lived in Sweden for 20 years when Fadime was murdered. Um, she didn't speak any Swedish because it's common in Scandinavia that immigrants, even if they live there for a long time, don't learn other languages. Uh, so when Fadime was shot by the father and the mother was running out of the apartment of her daughter where she was shot to seek help, she knocked on doors, but she didn't know what to say. She couldn't even say help in Swedish. Of course, the people understood there was something. Um, but this mother, who was illiterate and, and, and you know, so knew so little about Sweden, and who really felt that what her daughter did was very wrong to live the way her daughter did, yet her do the mother went out of her way to reconnect with the daughter. So I see her as a bridge builder. She was not willing to ostracize Fadima, but she was being, being made by males who had more power in the family to do so. So that's one of the lessons of the story is also that, well, mothers, it's very important to reach out to mothers because often in the families, they are the ones who know the children best and who have the role of being the emotional bridge builders. Um, I would also like to say of oh, Fadime's father, he shot his daughter, but I, as I understand the case, he did it to spare his son. Fadime said publicly two months before she was killed, she said publicly in her speech in the parliament building, she said, my brother was given the task to kill me and that the family had wanted him to do it before he was 18 years old because then he, wouldn't be give, he would be given a lenient sentence. Well, he tried, but he didn't manage. The day Fadime came back to Uppsala, we know that her, brothers, her, brothers, her brother knew. But among the siblings, I mean, Fadime's parents had five daughters and only one son. And if the son had taken Fadime's life, of course, he would have gone to jail for a lifetime because by then he was 23. So the way I see her father, he shot her to spare his son so that he wouldn't have to do it uh, being um, impelled by others in the family. Um, it is often the case that these orders to, to take a life may come from Turkey or from Pakistan or from remote places. And parents in a place like Sweden may feel that they do not have the choice to decide over their own children's lives. So reforming, reconceptualizing honor is also a way of setting uh, families free. Fadime, in her speech in Parliament, said, and I will quote her, 
<clears throat> she said, and she speaks it two months before she is murdered. She says, looking back now, I believe that things need not get as out of hand as they did in my case. If my parents had been supported and helped by a national organization like, for example, the Kurdish society, it should not have come to this. If society had taken its responsibility and helped my parents to feel that they had a greater stake in Swedish society, then perhaps this might have been avoided. What happened to me cannot be undone, but I think it is important to learn something from it and do something in the future so that such cases are not repeated. I have chosen to tell my story for you today in the hope that it might help other immigrant girls so that others won't have to go through what I have endured. If everyone carries their straw to the haystack, then this kind of thing need not happen again. Regardless of one's cultural background, it should be obvious that every young woman should be able to have both her family and the life she wants for herself. Sadly, to many girls, this is not at all obvious. So I hope that you won't turn your back on them, that you don't close your eyes to them. Thank you for listening. Those were Fabina's words. I would be happy to take questions and comments. Yes, please. Um, there's a, a feeling that in this country, um, I mean, it's very rare. I don't think I've ever heard of an honor killing happening in the United States. Um, and there's a feeling here that uh, the US does a better job of integrating immigrants than Europe. Um, do you think that's true? And if so, why? You are saying that uh, you don't think there have been such an Achilles in the States and that there is a feeling here that U.S. does a better job of integrating immigrants than Europe. Is that the case and then why? And to begin with the last question, yes, in Europe too, we have the feeling that you have succeeded better in this country. But one reason why you are succeeding better is that you are getting a different group of immigrants from most of those. You are getting the better educated ones, at least for, you know, from the Middle East. Uh, we are getting the more uneducated, you know, the illiterate. Uh, and uh, there's also, uh, well, there have been studies showing that the social welfare system of places like Scandinavia can in some respects undermine integration because it becomes too easy for people just to live on social welfare. Um, but it's a complex issue, and these are just a few. Regarding honor killings in the States, I think last year in Texas, there was a man who killed both his two young daughters, 16 and 17 years old. It was an honor killing. There was one in Atlanta two, three months ago the father and took his daughter, and there was an attempt in New York State where a brother tried to kill his sister recently and didn't succeed. So it may be that they think these things have been happening here, but that there hasn't been awareness, and often such things are covered up. Thank you. Did Fatima's boyfriend know that what could happen to her? Did he know what would happen to her if they uh, took up this relationship? Uh, yes, he knew that he, her life was at risk, yes, but Fadima made the choice. She, she said publicly it was a very difficult choice. She knew that if she chose this Patrick, then she would be ostracized from her family. It was a horrible choice, but she, she chose him. And she was an optimist, so she was hoping that somehow she... First, she was hoping that the Swedish police would be able to protect her. So... Uh, yeah, but we've also had a case recently in Sweden, another case, which I, where there was a young uh, Afghani girl from Afghanistan 
was having a very, very hard life at home. And she fell in love with another Afghani boy. And then she threatened to commit suicide if he wasn't willing to run away with her because she wanted to get away from home. They were going to force her to marry. And the boy didn't want to run away with her because he knew it would be dangerous. So he tried, but she said she would commit suicide if he didn't. So they ran away, and uh, he was murdered by her brother. It was a recent case in Sweden. So, I mean, these are the extreme cases. I don't want you to think that this is how immigrants behave. They are extreme cases. Uh, but uh, they are extreme cases that do show us something about what is at stake in, in, uh, in other cases. And the problem of forced marriage is one that's really coming to the fore in Europe. She was 21 when she um, had her boyfriend. Is there a certain age that she actually can have a boyfriend or get married? It is not permitted at any age. If you are 27, it's not permitted. Boyfriends are not permitted. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't have, however old she had been, it wouldn't have been permitted. And the families had actually been wanting to marry her off since she was 15. And she had been, yeah. And there are many girls who are even married so young. It's a good yeah. question. If you were in the same situation as her, would you have like gone public with it? I am often asked to give advice to young girls who are in a similar situation. And my advice is always, do not go public with it. The, the moment it has become public, the chances increases that something awful will happen. Uh, I try when I'm contacted by young girls to, to meet with, to, to, to mediate, often by using leaders from immigrant organizations. Like she was saying, had the Kurdish national organization in Sweden tried to talk to her parents, maybe this could have been prevented. So I, in Europe, it appears that if you go to the media with your story, uh, you are in a more dangerous spot. But some do anonymously, some do anonym anonymously. What's next? If this and is the next? multicultural world, is yeah. there something after this? Yeah. The European countries have done a poor job at integrating immigrants from non-Western societies, many of whom come with a tribal background. And when they are doing a poor job at integrating, it means that the men feel marginalized. They feel that their masculinity is eroded. They feel they don't have any good identity. The Swedes have a wonderful word, which is called utanförskap. It means you're living on the outside. And it does seem that many males are then compensating for the lack of self-regard that could be de derived from jobs and from having a position in society by violence. And uh, speaking of schools, in Europe, generally, of course, boys have a much higher rate of dropout from schools. I think that applies in every country. So many of the, these boys who are, have this kind of background, tribal background, with an honor code, overcompensate. And then there's another thing, and that's that often their feelings of, of, that they are justified in using violence is being reinforced by people back home, let's like, say Pakistan or uh, or who, who are, who are whom, in whom, with whom they are in communication and who are saying you should do this and that. So in order to rethink honor and, and get people to stand up for a concept that is in, in accordance with human rights and well-being, we have to do a better job at integration in Europe, definitely. And there are many men I have to say in the immigrant communities, there are many men who are also working for this. It's not so that it's females thinking about it. Not really. The evolution of women's rights yes. has been a bumpy road. Yes. And um, those who have it and are born with it perhaps don't have the background right. to understand. I mean, in Europe, if you didn't do what your parents said, they sent you to a convent. Right. right. So, uh, maybe you could share a little bit about uh, the, the Scandinavian background. 
Okay. Not just no, not just Scandinavia, but, but historically. Historically, yeah, yeah. Women's uh, equality, uh, gender equality, has been a, a bumpy road, as Mrs. Ross says, in Europe. Uh, like in my uh, my grandmothers, I came from the very north. They were working women, but in in a higher society, it would be inconceivable for women to be working in my grandmother's time. And I think um, the, the first woman to graduate from university in, in Norway was in 1905. Uh, it is um, the, the, the struggle for, for, for gender equality has been an ongoing one. And as you say, bumpy, where we feel that we have been given equal rights and then there are backlashes. Um, but um, this is to say that also in the countries that immigrants are coming from, things are changing. And that in, we have to give them time to, to, to walk some of the road that we are walking, if that is the road they want to go. Of course, in many of these countries, they do not want to have the kind of gender equality that, that probably you, know, you stand up for. And, the Ross School stands up for, and in Norway and Sweden we stand up for. But it is important in Scandinavia that we stand up for a core value, which is that every individual, regardless of gender or ethnicity or religion, should be able to choose their own life, be she a man or a woman. Thank you.